So today, I think the email that I sent out, we have Paul Lambert here to present to us. And without further introduction, I'll let you do everything that you want to do. And we'll get your presentation going and hop right into it. No, no uh, administrative anything. Scott just said, get it going. The first time I've ever been in a class where there's no admin to be done. So. <laughs> Oh, we can if you want. No, it's all right. I'm happy to. I'm happy to take the time. We'll we'll run out. So, um, uh, it's really wonderful for me to be here. Thank you for. Um, well, I guess Scott's the one that made the invitation, but uh, on behalf of you, so I'm I'm thrilled to be here. Um, BYU is a wonderful place uh, for me. I'm a BYU grad. Actually, I did my undergraduate here, and and I love it. Um, uh, I did just a little bit of background on me. Uh, so I did my undergrad here. I did my master's degree at, at Tufts University in the in the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy, and then a doctorate at, at Georgetown University. Um, BYU is who I'm loyal to. I get uh, I get asked for money from all three of those institutions. BYU is the only one that. Uh, um, um, I really do love BYU because I love its mission, um, and I know I hope truly hope that you hear this. Uh, I can't start a lecture at BYU without saying this. Um, what a privilege it is to be here for me, for you. Um, it is an honor to be at BYU. Um, so many people want to be here, don't have the chance to do it. Uh, in one of my current assignments, um, I give a lot of ecclesiastical endorsement uh, uh, endorsements to applicate, applicants to BYU. Um, a lot of those wonderful, wonderful youth don't get to come here. Um, you're here. And I hope every day that you step your foot on campus, uh, you feel that it's a privilege because it is. Um, and I feel that privilege uh, now as I step on campus uh, today. Um, so what are we talking about today? We're talking about religion. Um, we're talking about uh, spirituality in, in our professions, in our lives. Um, uh, let me give you a little bit of background on, on why uh, why I'm here, why, why BYU has me come and, and give lectures like this uh, and, and how we get into this. Um, so my background is mostly in academia. I've, I've taught uh, at various universities and been in different administrative positions. Uh, and then, oh, maybe around 2015, I started looking at uh, what does religious freedom have to do with um, stability? Uh, around the world. Um, I was looking at it more in a foreign policy area, but then I transitioned to looking at it more of an economics. What does it have to do with economic stability and, and the way that economies either, you know, are thriving or not? Um, and, and then I started looking, that's a macro level, right? Looking at economies. And I started looking at a micro level. What, what does this mean in business? And, I'll, and, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Uh, but I want to start by just asking you what why does this matter? So you've probably heard about religious freedom or religious pluralism, probably more often in the context of legal issues, right? What the latest Supreme Court case, how it was decided, or, or whether the Constitution protects this or that, right? I'm, I'm assuming that's probably how you've engaged with the idea of religious pluralism uh, or religious freedom most in your, in your life. But let me ask you this. Why why would we want to talk about religion in a professional environment in a workplace? Why does it matter? As a matter of agency, it creates safety um, for for all those who participate in the workplace that they know that their that their beliefs will be respected and that they won't be discriminated against. And then, like on a moral level, I mean, on like outside of the workplace, part of the reason we believe it's important is because. We, we believe we believe in agency and we believe that you can let all men worship where how and what they may right? okay great so you've you said two things one if we can create a space where someone feels confident in their religious identity they're going to feel better okay or feel safer um why does that matter well I mean, it matters on an individual level, but from an institutional standpoint, you're going to have your best performance um, from people who feel safe and comfortable doing work where you, where you are. Perfect. Um, this, this, this point 
is you can't gloss over it. This has major implications on a professional environment. And that's why you see, for example, I'll get into this in a minute too. That's why you see so much emphasis put on what's usually called DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion in corporate settings. Because it's not because companies are altruistic. It's not because they, I mean, I hope they sort of are. I hope they do have a, a true commitment to their employees. But the reason they engage in DEI initiatives is for bottom line. If they can get the most out of their employees, their company benefits, right? So that's, that's a principle that's really important for us to remember. It's not the only reason we should do this, but it's something we have to uh, remember in a professional environment. I saw another hand somewhere. Yes. I think too, that if you, if any kind of person feels safe in your, in your company, then you're going to be able to get a wider range of ideas and solutions because there's more, because there's more. Exactly. So we're going to actually talk about that as well. The, the power of diversity. Um, I, We'll come back to that because there's a, a few points I want to make around that. Okay, the other point that was made here, sorry, names. Let me, let me I'm going to try. Stephanie. Stephanie. Aaron. So Stephanie made another point, which is unique to where we are um, at BYU, talking about what we believe. Now, I'm assuming most of you are members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I am as well. If you're not, that's okay. When I use terms like religion, I'm not only referring to uh, members of, of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I mean, I'm referring to anyone that has um, a belief in something, okay? So uh, this is not exclusionary language, but assuming that most of you are members of the church, I'll use that vernacular, okay? Um, so Stephanie made a comment about our belief in agency and creating space for people to believe how we, how we and what they may, right? That, that's, that's absolutely true. I also hope by the end of this discussion, I've convinced you, or at least gotten you on the path to convincing, that the most powerful asset that you have is your faith in Jesus Christ. As an individual, as a professional, as a father, as a mother, as a sibling, as a friend, as a community member, as an everything. I, I truly hope that that is a persuasive argument to you through this, through this um, discussion today. Let me suggest another reason why religious freedom or religious pluralism is really important. And I, and I think this will ring true to you. There's lots of definitions of religious freedom. Most of them are legal. This is probably one you haven't heard. And let me, let me suggest to you. Religious freedom can be defined as the ability to allow, it allows people to do good. Now, what's at the heart of virtually every, every religious tradition? Call it a golden rule, call it the two great commandments, call, you know, any number of ways that we define it based on our religious uh, worldview. It is to care for one another. It is to love our neighbor. It is to treat them as we, we hope to be treated. Right? It is to elevate. It is to make our world a better place. It's to return back to Heavenly Father. These are core pillars of religion, all religions. If I show up to my professional environment, feeling confident in my identity, in this case, as a disciple of Jesus Christ, what have you allowed me to do? You've allowed me to link my work with my desire to honor God, to, to follow him, to follow his commandments, to bless those around me, to treat them with the respect and love that I've been asked to do, that I've been, that I've been asked to give. By, by providing religious pluralism, by, by creating environments of religious accommodation, what we are doing is we're allowing people to do good, <laughs> contribute in a meaningful way. Another principle that I hope, that I hope uh, you'll remember. Okay, so you might say, oh, Paul, this is all really nice. Nice ideas, but do they, you know, this is corporate America we're talking about. Do they really care? Um, yes. They do. Um, so this is every year I participate. I, I do a lot of work with an organization called the Religious Freedom and Business Foundation, which puts this study together every year uh, where we evaluate the Fortune 200 companies um, in, the, in, the, in America. Um, and 
And then we highlight those that are doing the best on, you know, call it faith friendliness or religious accommodation, um, religious diversity, equity, inclusion, you can call it a number of different things, but we, we highlight those and celebrate those that are doing the best. These are the companies that are doing the best that did that, that ranked the best in 2022. The reason I'm putting this up here is these, these aren't small companies. And you know, you, you recognize, I, I would expect you'd recognize every single one of those companies with the exception of maybe Equinix. And for this, for this crew, you may not know Yoga Tea very well, but anyway, they're a big company. Um, these, are, these are huge companies. These are companies that are willing to invest millions of dollars in efforts to create accommodating spaces for their workers. Why? Because they know it's good for their business. And these are companies that are specifically investing in religious accommodation. Not in and of itself. This slide in and of itself should be eye-opening to you. Because probably like many people, you, you do not think of Google, wherever they are, and think, oh yeah, they're a really religiously accommodating company. Because that hasn't been the culture in the past. Right? But it is now because companies are seeing that there's, there's purpose and reason in this. And so there's been real, real movement um, to, to look at accommodation. So there's a, there's a business case. So let me keep talking about this business case quickly. Um, I'm gonna talk, which I'm gonna actually skip, skip this slide and, and just talk about it in these two ways. So there's a macro and a micro level. I wanna really briefly go over the macro level. Um, I'm gonna throw some statistics at you. Um, if that's your jam, you'll love it, you'll want more, we can talk later. If it's not your jam, bear with me. Um, statistics. If you look, for example, at e emerging economies, right? So put your, put your professional hat on, your business hat on here and thinking, okay, I have a global business. I want to invest in different markets. Where, where, are the, where are the opportunities that I have to grow my business? If you're looking at that, if you're looking at emerging markets, the top 10 emerging markets in the world, now I'm not talking biggest economies, I'm talking emerging markets, ones with the fastest growth rates, right? If you're looking at the top 10 emerging markets in the world over the past six years, every single one of them, with the exception of one from year to year, which is China, which they're slowing, of course. But anyway, the, the, every single one of them are religious majority countries. Now, when I say religious majority, what I mean is over 50% of their population self-identify as religious. Okay? They affiliate as religious, that it's important to them. And I'm actually not talking about just 51%. In every single one of those countries, again, with the exception of China, every single one is above 90. So 90, per, 90 plus percent of your population self-identifies as religious. Religion is important to me. It's how I identify myself. If you are a business person running a global business, you better understand your clients or your potential clients. And if religion is how people identify themselves, you better get it. And you better get it in your market strategy as you go out and you better get it internally. Okay. Another quick statistics on the macro level. You, right now, the world right, is, is about 84% self-affiliation with religion. Okay. That might be surprising to us because we live in the United States, which is on a slightly is on decline. If you're from Europe, that's very surprising because they're on a steeper decline in religious affiliation. But the rest of the world, which have higher birth rates, um, and higher populations are the opposite of a religious affiliation. What that means is by 2050, 87% of the world will self-affiliate as religious. Well, the implications of that are huge. That's a 23 to 1 ratio. That's not to say that people that don't affiliate as religious are, are, are bad or anything. I'm not, I'm not making a judgment call. It's just a reality. More and more people in the world are self-affiliating as religious. Religion is gaining an influence. Okay. So that matters if you're in if you're in any industry, in any profession, that matters. Th these kind of statistics. Okay, let's let's transition to the micro now. Yes. I'm just curious about that. Is that based on the number of individuals in the world? So it takes an in China is like 8.2 billion. And if they're religiosity or religious affiliation is down, well, it, I, would, I would expect it to be maybe a 70 instead of a high 80. Yeah, that's that's a great question. So it takes in all those. So the, the main factors to think about there, I mean, you do have China, which is, is less religious, although there are plenty of religious people that just don't have the same rights as a lot of others. But China, you know, China's birth rate is slowing significantly. But if you look at places like India, Indonesia, 
um, all of the African continent, they have much higher birth rates and they are much more religiously affiliated. So for example, in, in the African continent, we're going to see a huge increase in Christianity um, or it's, 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 that's, that's what they're, they're expecting. And so that's, that's where that, those numbers come from. So it is in real numbers of population growth and, and then also affiliation. Um, okay, so the micro. So what is this? My, when I say micro, I mean like people working within an organization, okay? Why does this matter at a micro level? Well, one, it matters because you want to recruit the best people you can, right? This is going back to the, the point that Stephanie and Karen, yes, that Karen made, that if you want to recruit the best people and retain the best people, then you have to have not just policies, but practices in place that help them feel accommodated, help them feel like I can be who I want to be, right? And this is a big movement right now, but usually that movement is around gender, race, sexual orientation, which is great, right? We need that kind of work as well. We absolutely need that work so that people of those affiliations also feel confident and comfortable in their work, workspaces so they can give everything they can, right? It's also human dignity, right? We want all people, this is, this is core to us. We want all people to have human dignity. Part of that is their religious affiliation, right? How they identify them, uh, uh, themselves in their faith. So at a micro level, if we can get this right, and, and the data is there, if we can get this right, then we're much more likely to have effective organizations, whether these are corporations or NGOs or government organizations. Um, I'm not gonna, I, we could spend weeks looking at the data around DEI and its benefit. I put this one up, these are two, this one's, one's from McKenzie, one's from Deloitte. I put this one up here because I thought it was particularly interesting. This is, even the perception of an organization that does DEI well has huge implications on, on effectiveness within their organization. Not even the reality. You don't even have to prove it with the numbers. You just have to have the perception that you're doing well at DEI and, and things like uh, innovation go up. That's powerful, right? Let's not just make the perception. Let's, let's get it. Let's, let's do the real deal. Um, but, but this has a, a major impact on on an organization and its effectiveness. I don't want to spend a lot of time, but this is the business case, right? This is this is me trying to prove to you that this matters and not just in a in a theoretical way, but in a, in a in a real way. So, okay, what does it look like in an actual organization? So let me play this video for you. Um, and this is, can you just in, in the same? This is at Google. Um, let me tell you really quick the, the story at Google. So Google years ago, didn't want to touch religion with a 10-foot pole. And we, we had had interactions with them and said, we, we know that you're doing some internal things to allow people to express themselves, but you're not being very open about it. Can we get you to speak at some organizations talking about it? They said, no, we, it's, too, it's too tricky. It's, if we go out and talk about religion, we're just welcoming controversy. We, we don't want to do it. And then they did an internal survey several years ago, and the internal internal survey came back. I'm, this is the this is the sh short version. The internal survey came back, and 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 what they found was that a big part of their hundreds of thousands of employees, twelve thousand less as of last week, but hundreds of thousands, many of their hundred thousand employees were feeling bummed out because they saw their company doing these wonderful things around accommodation and inclusion, but their primary identifier, which was their faith, they didn't feel like was being recognized. And it was having a real, a real impact on morality. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, on morale um, uh, in, in the workplace. <laughs> that would be funny. Um, <laughs> sorry. Um, was having a real impact on morale uh, in the workplace, and Google did a 180. They they said, "Okay, we're growing our our focus on faith. We're going to go public with it." They called us and said, "Hey, uh, we would we we do a big conference with Fortune uh, 500 companies every year where we talk about this issue." And they said, "Can we keynote and also we're putting this this video together? Can you broadcast it? We want it. We want it to go out to the world. We want the whole world to know." that we are friendly to faith. This was like almost overnight. Now, I'm sure that there were some wonderful people in Google that had been wanting to do this for the right reasons. Why do they do this? 
they saw the, the business case for it. Let's let's hit play on that. The vision of the Inner Belief Network is to create a thriving community where Googlers are empowered to safely practice their beliefs, setting the gold standard for promoting mutual respect, understanding, and allyship. IBN is the acronym for the Interbelief Network. IBN is a place for people of many different faith communities to feel represented at Google and to build a sense of community for themselves. It's a great platform for people of various faiths coming together. To me, IBN means connection. Being connected with people who are like me and who are not like me, who I can learn from, who I can help encourage, who I can be encouraged by, but also just knowing that I'm not alone, that there are people like me who really see faith as an essential part of their identity. We currently have five chapters. We have the Buddhist group, the Muslims, the Christians, Interfaith, and our Jugglers. IBN has now given all of these different faiths chapters a voice at the table. I belong to the Christian chapter here at Google. The chapter that I'm part of is IBN Muslims. I'm part of the Google Christian Fellowship. I belong to the Buddhist chapter. I belong to the Jugglers chapter, specifically Jugglers New York. I'm also an ally for several other chapters. I'm a member of the Interfaith chapter of IBN. The Interfaith chapter of IBN is a place both to have discussions with members of different faith communities and is of course open to everyone. It's also a place that will represent the interests of those smaller faith communities that maybe aren't ready to organize themselves into their own sub-chapter of IBN and to make sure that their needs are addressed within Google and within our products and to build a sense of community for them. We host special lunches, cross-chapter initiatives. We host talks and lectures. We've been hosting things on anti-hate and how you can be an ally to your religious colleague. We work on anything that's related to a, a belief system, and we work to educate other Googlers about their colleagues so that everybody feels included at Google. IBN really lines up with the vision that Google has for its employees, being fully inclusive. Our mission does not include watering down of any religion or faith group at all whatsoever. We actually strive to highlight the beautiful differences that each one of our faith groups has. For me personally, it really enriches the workplace to kind of know where people come from, why they do what they do, how they think. It helps me work better with them. When I became a part of this network, I learned so much about other faiths. Can we understand each other as facets of the same diamond that shines through. I'm very proud to be a part of IBM. It's had profound impact on my time at Google. We're making sure there's no bias there, we're making sure people get the right information at the right time, and, and that's what I think the power of this group is for not only our teams inside of Google, but for billions of people that use our products every single day. So isn't that just so cool? Isn't that just get you excited? I mean, I know I get excited about it, um, but I think that's so amazing. Right? This is an organization that is recognizing the power that faith plays in people's lives, not only their employees, but this last guy, he's a global vice president of product development. So they're recognizing that the role of faith in the lives of their clients, and their clients are a lot of people, right? This is amazing. It's it's wonderful. Um, so let me let me transition. So that's that's one example. I could give you all kinds of examples of different organizations um, and, and how they're approaching this, and it's different in each organization. Um, but let me let me transition a little bit to. So a lot of the work I do, I actually do a lot of consulting for companies like Google, where I go in and help them understand. Well, what does this actually look like? Why? Are, what are the benefits? You know, all these kind of things, and help them set up. Um, in their management practices and the way they structure their strategy and, and et cetera, et cetera. And, and usually I'm looking at it in two different levels. I'm looking at it kind of a company-wide or corporate level, and then I'm looking at an individual level. And, and the, the short version of that is, well, how, does you, how do you need to be thinking about this organization-wide? And then how do you need to be thinking about this in, in a team, for example, and how you manage a team? Um, I want to give you two concepts that I hope are meaningful to you. Um, uh, what I would call tools for you to think about as you go out into your professional career. Now, I'm not, I don't know if any of you are going to go into the tech and I, I don't want to limit this to tech, right? This isn't about tech. This is about professional organizations. You're all going to go do something in, 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 professionally, right? And these same concepts 
apply whether you're at Google, whether you're in the local government, whether you're in academia, whether, it doesn't matter. These, these principles apply anywhere. So at, at, a, at a macro, or I won't call it macro, so I'd use that word. At an institutional level, one of the things we often, I often talk about is um, connecting this to the business approach, or connecting to this, this to the mission. Um, I hope this is a tool for you as you go out in, into the world, right? When you go into your workplace and you say, I want to live by my religion because I want to live by my religion, you might get someone to say, uh, yeah, okay, um, I understand why that would be good. Much more powerful is I want to be able to live according to my faith and I want my colleague who's totally different than me to be able to live according to her faith because we are better employees for you if we do that. Right, tie this to the, the business outcome, tie it to what it is that organization is there for, right? Your organization isn't and shouldn't and never will be a church. We're not trying to recreate church at work. We're trying to accommodate individuals that are in a workplace contributing to a common cause in that workplace, right? Google should not never be a church. That's not what it is. And that and its shareholders don't want it to be a church. That's not its purpose. But it's individuals that come to show up to Google should feel free to be who they are, right? And when they do that, they are better employees. That's that's the articulation that we need to apply to every workplace, right? So that's that's the only principle I'm going to go off of, of of those that I that I often those principles that I often talk about in in my consulting. Let's talk about now this individual level, I, and I think this I want to spend a little bit more time on this. I think this will be interesting and exciting to you, and I hope I hope helpful to you um, as you go out into I, right now. In, in your university life, but also as you go out into other settings. And I wanna focus in on um, actually this one, number four, developing religious literacy. Now, when you hear religious literacy, you're probably thinking, oh, world religions and you know, facts and dates and theological history, and, and, I'm, and that's all wonderful, but that's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about with religious, religious literacy is really human literacy. The ability for you and I to understand each other, right? So let me talk about a couple of ideas that, again, I think will, will be meaningful. And given that most of us are from the same religion, this also applies to our experience as members of the church. Um, so think about that as we, as we go through this. So I want to suggest to you, this is actually, I'm, I'm, I'm taking this model from some other scholars um, um, that, that study this, <clears throat> the, the three Bs model, belong, belief, belonging, and behavior. So I want you to think if you were to chart your experience with your faith, what would it look like? For example, if I'm Catholic, maybe it's the, it's the behavior within Catholicism that really, really matters to me. That, that speaks to me. It's the, it's the things that I do. It's the, the ways that I live because I'm Catholic, because of my Catholic teachings, right? For others, it might be the belonging. It might be the fact that I, I feel like I belong when I go to that congregation. That, that's, it's a group of people that I associate with that, that are meaningful to me. It's the belonging that really, that's how I, when I say I'm Catholic, that's what I mean. That's what I'm referring to. That circle is really big for me, right? Or perhaps it's the belief. It's the doctrine. It's the belief in, in the afterlife. It's, it's, it's that that really, when I say I'm Catholic, I'm thinking of all of that, right? I'm thinking of the, the, my faith in, in the doctrines of, of Catholicism. The point is for each one of us, now, like I said, each, most of us are of the same faith, but if each of us were to plot our religious identity using these three concepts, every single one of them would be different, even though we all share the same label, right? Is, does that make sense? So what does that mean? Well, that means that when I'm in a workplace and I meet someone and they say, hi, my name is so-and-so uh, and, and, and I'm Muslim, we are always so tempted to say, oh, great, that's awesome. I know this Muslim. My friend is Muslim and I know a lot about them. Thus, I know about you. Wrong. I mean, let me give you an example that's going to make you feel, Ugh. I know women in my life. I'm married to one. So if I met you, if you're a woman, and you and he's oh my name's Angela, I said oh hi nice to meet you Angela, I know everything about you, <laughs> and my man as your manager I'm going to treat you in the same way because I I know this other woman, 
and I'm going to I'm going to treat you and all those stereotypes I have about this other one. I'm going to apply them to you because you're also a woman, right? I, I feel cringy even saying it. You're feeling uncomfortable. We're all staring at our shoes right now, right? That that is not the way we should engage and interact with one another. But it's really easy for us to do with labels like Muslim or Catholic or Mormon or Christian or atheist or et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So what are some ways that we can do better at this in our context? Yes. Oh, just a question about this. So these people who lost their identity then, are these like just referring to like the historical construction of that identity or the current state of that identity? Does that make sense? Great, great question. I would say actually a third, the current experience with that identity, right? That, that you as an individual is experiencing. Obviously the inputs to that identity, you know, the inputs to my identity as a member of the Church of Jesus Christ have everything to do with the doctrines. They have everything to do with the history of the church, but they are mine, right? They're my experiences. It's how I experience uh, the church or the, or, the, or the gospel. And that's what's most important, right? particularly when we're talking about a, a professional context. What the church's position on X is much less important than the experience of Brian, right? And, and our interest in a workplace is to understand and, and accommodate Brian, right? And so what we need to do is understand his experience uh, and learn from him and how he engages those things as opposed to the label that he wears. So how do we do that? We do that through uh, respectful curiosity, right? So here, here are three premises, and this actually goes to, sorry, what was your name? Royce. Royce. This goes to Royce's question. These are three premises that we should always keep in mind. One, that religions are internally diverse, right? Because they're made up of people. Right? They're not uniform. I think we all understand that. It's pretty intuitive. Um, religions are dy dynamic and changing. Think of the kinds of changes that we've experienced over the past few years in our own faith. Isn't that wonderful that, that all religions can, can change, right? We believe that's that's inspired revelation. And that's wonderful. The, the same thing, types of things happen in other faiths too. And so we need to recognize that that these are that religions are dynamic and changing. And that our perceptions need to, we need to be humble in our uh, perception of those of those other faiths, even our own, um, so that we're prepared to understand that. They're not fixed. And then in, religious influences are embedded everywhere. Think of your own life and how your faith in Jesus Christ impacts everything, hopefully everything that you do. And recognize that that same thing is happening for someone else. And it's man it manifests itself in so many different ways. So what does that mean? What are the things that we can do? We, number one, we can treat people as individuals and not representatives of their religion. And that means asking questions about them. Oh, I understand that you are, you said that you're Jewish. Tell me what that, that means to you. Tell me, tell me how you experience Judaism. I'm really interested in that. I um, mean, understanding your, your experience with Judaism, right? That would be a wonderful question to help you understand that person as opposed to the label that they wear. Uh, and I just gave you a, an open-ended question, right? Um, recognize that 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 religious expression, like I said before, is, is everywhere and, and try and understand that. This, these, these are tools, what I'm giving you, these are tools that you can apply to help create an environment of accommodation that's meaningful and that's beneficial to you and your colleague. So let me, let me say something on that note. Um, we've discussed in the very beginning when Stephanie made her comment about if we feel free to bring ourselves, we're gonna be, we're gonna be better contributors, right? And I know that's what we want to be, right? We all want to add value to our organizations. We all want to be successful. We want to, we want to do our best. If there is one thing you remember from what I say today, it's this, I hope. The best professional that you can be is the best member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints that you can be. If you are Jewish, the best professional that you can be the best member of the Jewish faith that you can be, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Your faith is your greatest asset. Yeah. Be loyal to that. 
recognize that your greatest contribution, your most authentic contribution is going to be through your most authentic self. And that same truth and principle holds true for your colleague of a different faith. So your goal is to create that space, not just for you, but for them. And if we can do that successfully, we're thriving. We're also doing what God has asked us to do. And we're also fulfilling the example of Jesus Christ to bring it home uh, to this environment. I'd rather just cut that. I'm going to throw it away. Um, voice. Um, I hope I hope that that, that is a, a powerful uh, concept to you. And on that note, let me let me kind of wrap up, uh, and then we can have some questions. Let me wrap up with what this means to me. So let me tell you my big thesis or my big hypothesis: why I do what I do. So after working in academia and in business for for a while, and as thinking about these concepts, um, this is this is my this is my personal thesis. My feeling is the world would be a better place if we can establish freedom of conscience, if we can all be free to worship how we choose, if we can be free to live according to our agency. I believe that. Not only do I have faith in that teaching as a disciple of Christ, I believe that to be true in our societies. I believe in religious freedom, in other words. So years ago, I decided looking at the, the, the power of doing this in, in, a, in a professional context, I thought well, society sometimes really struggles with this concept. Um, and in society, it's acceptable for me to say, oh, you're of the other way of looking at things. You're an idiot. I hate you. End of discussion. And society is, has, is, is okay with us engaging in that way. In a workplace, we can't do that. Isn't that great? Because we're all part of a common cause. We're there to produce something, either a service, a product, whatever it is. We all have to come together. We're not allowed to leave it at, I hate you, end of discussion. We have to do better. If we don't do better, there's consequences. I love that as a medium for experiencing the principles of religious pluralism and religious freedom and religious accommodation. And so I decided I'm going to go out and do the best I can to promote this within professional organizations, within our professional lives. Because if we can experience religion, the, the benefits and the values, the principles of religious pluralism in our workspace, which happens to be the most diverse place that we'll ever find ourselves in, our, the diversity, we aren't going to find a lot of diversity in our churches, in our homes, in our communities, not as much at least. We're going to find it in our workplaces, most likely. And that's where we spend a lot of time. If we can experience those kind of those kind of principles and values in there, I think we'll take it home with us. I think we'll take it into our communities, into our nations. Right? That's my that's my thesis. So how did I come to this? Um, and this comes back to where I started, uh, which about my feelings about BYU. When I was here at BYU, I was I was an American Studies major, um, and I remember studying one day about some ism, some cultural ism. Um, I did a lot of studying of, and, and I had the following impression, and, I, and, and it was the Holy Ghost speaking to me, and it said, in essence, Paul, you know that one of the great crowning characteristics of Christ is his ability to understand you comprehensively. That, what, that's what gives him the ability to meet you wherever you are, to succor you, to provide mercy to you in a way that is most meaningful to you, that's, that, that meets you in, in your need. Christ can do that because he, com he comprehensively understands me and us. It said, you can be like the Savior by understanding others. And it changed the whole way I looked at my education. Instead of just learning about peoples of the earth and peoples of society and, and the humanities because it was my assignment or because it was leading to a career, I realized I can align myself with the Savior. I can be more like him by understanding the people around me, both past and present. And the more I can understand them, the more prepared I am to love them. And that's been a driving thing for me. What I hope you find is your own driving force, your own ability to live out your faith 
as, it, as the great, incredible asset that it is. Seek to understand and, 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 and realize that living by your faith will give you the greatest tools that you can possibly have to contribute to the world around you, regardless of the profession that you are in, regardless of the way that you see the world. It's different. Your way of seeing the world is different than mine, and that's wonderful. So my, my invitation is that we can all find that. We can find that thing that's driving us and helping us and understand that, yes, our faith is an asset. It's not something to be afraid of. It's not something to hide under a bushel. It's something to celebrate. And that the faith of others also is something to celebrate. So let me end there. And we can, uh, we can then have any questions or discussions or any admin that wasn't able to happen at the beginning of the <laughs> class. Yes. Yeah, so I'm just a little curious as I think about this, because I, I love this. I, I work a lot in cultural context and there's lots of ties between it. And especially this emphasis on identity and belonging um, and this emphasis on individual identity is really good, but it can also bring up challenges when it's put into action or when there's conflicts between personal values and group values, right? Community values, whether it's a business or whether it's a team. and and. Do you, uh, in your work, like what guidance do you have for businesses when it comes to that kind of application, that level? Because I think it, uh, a lot of what you present has been at that belonging, that identity level and understanding, gaining an understanding. But then the next level of that is putting it into action. Right. So great question. And I will say, and this was a comment that um, I think it was Karen that made this in the beginning. And I meant to make this point. I didn't. So diversity in and of itself if you don't, if it's just diversity within an organization, the study shows it actually actually detracts from effectiveness. Unless you can create environments where diversity is harnessed, diversity actually takes away from productivity. But if you can create environments where you can harness that diversity and take advantage of it and allow people to come together, that's when you start having higher levels of, of um, productivity. But you're your question was more along the lines of what about when there's conflict? And look, you're going to face conflict. I'm not here to say that, oh yeah, once you, once you talk about these principles and you don't have conflict, you, you do. But if you have the principles in play, um, if you're following these kinds of principles, what you have is a framework to go back to, to figure them out, right? So when I'm in a business, for example, what I do is actually, I give them some really hard cases of conflict. And say, okay, so based on these principles, I don't have, I don't have a, I, there's no golden ticket of this will always fix the, the conflict. But if you follow these principles, you're going to find um, the solution that's, that's specific to your organization. Again, the beauty of a professional organization is that you're, you're focused on a common goal, right? You're, you have a common thing that you're trying to accomplish. And it isn't, the, the rules of the game aren't your, your church or your worldview. Those are permitted to be there, but right, we're on a common goal. So the, the goal isn't to prove my worldview versus your worldview. The goal is to be authentically the authentic selves, but to contribute to that common goal. Let me let me let me um, introduce a, a concept. I think maybe maybe be helpful helpful here. The the idea is or the concept is called covenantal pluralism. Um, covenantal pluralism is the idea that I will covenant with you. That I will I will protect and and respect your truth claims, whatever they are, but I don't have to give your truth claims moral. Um, I don't have to accept them. I don't have to say yes because you say that X is true. Then I will also say X is true. No, you say X is true. I say Y is true, but I am completely committed for, to your ability to do that, and you're completely committed to me to be able to say that Y is true. I, we're covenanting to protect each other even though we don't have to give moral equivalency to each other. And, and those kind of concepts can play out in an organization in really effective ways. It's not about winning. It's about, you know, in a, in a professional context, it's about getting to the, the, you know, the end game the best way that we can right? in our diverse context. I, I hope that's helpful. If it, it's, it's especially helpful if we had a specific example, right? Because then we can actually go through this kind of stuff and, and get there. And that's what I do in a, in a, in a setting when I'm doing consulting. Yes. And I don't know if this is a good example or not, but and it could be wrong. I apologize. But this just reminded me of a couple of months ago, I was in a meeting with Sister Hubeg where she was the, uh, the keynote speaker. And she said um, one of the most beautiful things she saw about religious uh, pluralism was 
when she's in the Middle East and she sees Palestinians and Israeli members of the community coming together to solve an issue and bringing all of their um, um, religious lives that are completely different from each other. But at that moment, when they need to solve a problem like there's a bombing, or they need to solve the problems in water with the Palestinians, um, they come together and they bring all of their diversity. But for the most part, they can solve some of the issues at a grassroots level. And, and, and Sister Eubank shared that with us. And again, I don't know if this is a good example. Maybe. So let me let me get, let me give you an example about that actually. So there's a company is on the on one of those slides called Equinix. You, none of you probably know Equinix, but Equ you've used Equinix over and over and over. They're the back end of places like Google. They provide all the internet infrastructure for organizations like Google. Equinix is a huge company, um, and and several years ago, maybe two years ago or so, in the middle, you know, you may recall, I think it was in April or so, there was a real climax of of issues in in Israel, Palestinian Israeli conflict. And everyone was worried that things were going to kind of spill over the edge. Equinix has a lot of operations out there, and they leaned into it because they know they knew like we have we have lots of Jewish and Muslim employees showing up to work every day, and and this is you know they can't just leave that at the door. This is who they are. We need to make sure they feel safe. So we have this company wide uh, all that we do once a year where the CEO comes on and blah 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 blah. And everyone, I mean, there's thousands of employees are part of this. And we're going to have a discussion about. Palestinian and Israeli conflict. Are you kidding? Who wants to touch that? Well, they did because they recognized that this was meaningful to our employees. They asked me to moderate that discussion, by the way. <laughs> Boy, did I prepare. Um, so we had so I so I identified Muslim employees and some some Jewish employees in the company, and I brought them together and we talked ahead of time. And we had a conversation about what it what it what it meant to be Muslim or 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 Jewish, and what these what these conflicts meant and experience. It was awesome, such an uplifting conversation. Did we solve the Israeli Palestinian conflict? No, that wasn't our objective. Our objective was to ensure that those individuals felt safe and secure in their workplace. And it was such a powerful experience for the whole company. That's what can happen when we lean into this stuff, when we follow principles that are about bringing people together, not about I'm right and you're wrong, but allowing people to give their, their, their you know, freeing them to do good where we started. If that's our objective, then we can do a, a amazing, amazing things. Yeah, Scott. Should we uh, do our homework as we get ready to enter the, the professional world, whether it's NFO, corporate, or academia, academia? If we're going to an institution that is not faith friendly, um, I mean, obviously there seems to be a burgeoning interest in some of the big companies doing that. But I mean, if I if if, if a company is not there yet, mm -hmm. um, do you think we can actually? help maybe move it to that point or should we avoid it or each case is right I, each case is individual but that's that's something right that you probably ought to look at you know in the same way that you know if you might look at a company and say what are their maternity or paternity policies I, i'd want to know that right you should look at this what are their policies around religious accommodation or or and in some cases that that may mean you want to go elsewhere and we have lots of cases where people have have traded companies and even taken pay cuts because look if you're for example if you're a muslim woman that wears a hijab you want to you want to walk into a place every day where you feel like everyone's just looking at you because of your hijab or are you willing to take a little bit less money and go to work in a place where you know that you're going to be respected and celebrated for who you are when you're living when you're wearing your religion on your on your sleeve or in this case on your head right that matters in fact i have a really great video maybe i can send it out later of a guy, a Jewish guy that was recruited and, and he was recruited into Texas Instruments. And he was worried about that. You know, it's down south. He was worried that he wore a yarmulke. He just wasn't me. And because they went out of their way to show him that they accommodated religion, he said it was, it made all the difference. It just brought the anxiety levels for him so down so much. And he's been there for years, he's an engineer. He's been there for years and has had such a positive experience because they are, they are, they, they make that part of the recruiting process. So, but yet, the other piece of that, can we make a change? Yes, it starts the conversation, right? Um, if you're an organization that isn't doing it, 
you need to have a conversation about how to do it. And you should call me and I can help you <laughs> figure that out. But they all start with a conversation. Every single one of these companies started with an employee that said, hey, what about this? And then it grew, right? To the point where the company said, yeah, we, we agree. We need to do this. Thank you. Any one last burning question? Well, we cannot. It's Roy, it's Roy, it's raise the hand, please. Dr. Kimmins. Talk a little about universities. About universities? Yeah, known to be woke. Yeah. <laughs> so universities um, are not as far along on this as businesses are. And, and, and the reasons for that are, are not surprising. Um, businesses are faster. They have profit. <laughs> they have bottom line. Um, they're quicker to adapt. Um, universities, depending on who they are, are better at this or worse than this. I, I know I'm giving you a pretty general answer. Um, they're just harder to change. Um, universities have been slower to the DEI movement also. And I don't want to, I don't want to equate this with DEI only. It's it can be part of DEI, it isn't defined only by DEI. But universities have they as they've moved further into DEI and recognizing these kind of influences have gotten a little bit more into this, but they've been slower than than most. Now, organizations like BYU or or Bay, obviously there's a little bit more of a lens towards faith or a big lens towards faith. And so there's a little bit more um willingness to have that conversation. Um in most cases, uh, but they are slow. They are further behind. Thank you very, very much. <laughs> now, if you are going to eat lunch today, and that means for those of you on Zoom as well, at lunch at home, you've got to commit to answering three questions for Paul Lambert. And we've sent we've sent those out, right? Or will? Uh, it's the assignment on Canvas. So, yeah, so there, he's asked us to give some feedback to him, and we're good at doing that. We understand the importance of that, that feedback loop. So if